In the first days of April 1945, when the total victory over Germany and the end of the Second World War in Europe were still a month away, Goloman wrote from somewhere in Luxembourg to his mother in Pacific Palisades. As an officer in American uniform, the second son of Katja and Thomas Mann had gone on an inspection tour of the occupied Rhineland. The Germans, he noted, were already practicing denial and wallowing in self-pity. Ja, ja, now the innocent must suffer for the guilty, he wrote in English, quoting from his conversations. But where are the guilty? He had asked in return, only to receive the following answer. Oh, they are gone. They were never many of them. You see, I am a Catholic. No one was a Nazi. This was also the gist of the reports sent home in disgust or disbelief by American war correspondents such as Martha Gellhorn and Margaret Bourke White. To the advancing allies, the majority of Germans appeared to be liars and cowards, although Goloman had met, quote, a few good people too, who had also spoken well of his father. But the pervasive willingness of Germans to distance themselves in the moment of defeat from the Nazi regime a regime whose morale-boosting slogans they had followed just a moment before, this willingness also offered an opportunity. After all, that was what the subsequent years in occupied Germany had to be about, to separate former party members and Volksgenossen from their faith in their late Führer and from the ideology of the Third Reich. For that, the Nuremberg trials, the temporary internment of the Nazi functioning elites, the so-called automatic arrest, and the bureaucratic process of mass denazification alone would not suffice. Other means and methods were required in order to rebuild the kind of freedom that Thomas Mann had held out as a hope to his German listeners in the summer of 1942 at a time when he was still convinced that his former compatriots were, quote, harnessed and splintered in the iron of terror. A few months later, Thomas Mann, angered and aghast at the accumulating news of the murder of the Jews and the other horrible crimes, was prone to hold the Germans collectively guilty. But that was not a promising way forward. On the contrary, blanket accusations, which admittedly never found their way into the official documents of Allied occupation, provided a welcome occasion for many Germans to deny any personal guilt or shared responsibility. So what it took was enlightening and educating the people. In fact, in the American zone of occupation in particular, great emphasis was placed on re-education through radio stations manned by returnees and confirmed opponents of Hitler, through newly established newspapers led by hand-selected, though politically not always untarnished, licensees, through town hall meetings allowing Germans to practice democracy at the grassroots level. Soon, there were also exchange programs for politically engaged young people. The participants in these programs generally returned to post-war Germany with a lifelong sympathy for the United States and the American way of life. Without this generous, thoughtful and long-term support from the United States, both material and non-material, the second German democracy would not have had such an easy, successful start as it may appear in hindsight. When the basic law of the Federal Republic was adopted in 1949, it could hardly be expected that it would still be around to celebrate its 75th birthday in 2024, and even less 
that it would serve as a model for a number of constitutions created in post-dictatorship Europe before and after 1989, as well as in South America. And yet, it is also true that as early as 1956, a Swiss journalist published a book whose surprisingly optimistic title would soon become a popular catchphrase, Bonn is not Weimar. As a matter of fact, and all things considered, the transformation of former Hitler followers into citizens of the Federal Republic succeeded rather quickly. That most Germans were willing, from the outset, to vote for democratic parties did not make them staunch Democrats. However, it opened up the opportunity for a progressive change of mind. And finally, even hearts. And to the extent that the new democracy soon became economically and politically successful, it won further trust. Today, however, this success story appears to be too simple a narrative, which has been told since the 1980s and with renewed vigor after the fall of the Berlin Wall. There are ample causes and reasons for that. When we think about German democracy today, the most important issues are the obvious erosion of a party system that had been stable for decades and the growing success of the populist right-wing party called Alternative for Germany, AfD, which first entered the Bundestag in 2017. By now, the party is clearly far-right and in parts under observation by the German Domestic Intelligence Service, and in 2024 it stands to win up to a third of the vote in three Landtag elections in Eastern Germany. Other key issues include the existence of violent far-right terrorism, which has long been underestimated or ignored, a contempt for democracy that has penetrated into the middle classes, and a growing and widening anti-Semitism. These problems raise the question of the structural flaws and deficiencies in the design and development of post-war German democracy. Deficiencies that have lingered on in the shadow of the Federal Republic's outward stability and economic success. The fact that right-wing populism and nationalism are gaining ground, not only across the Western world, but literally around the globe, does not make this problem any less important. Against the background of Germany's history of genocide, it continues to carry particular weight. We knew of these things, said Germany's first president, Theodor Heuss, in 1952 at the dedication of a memorial at the former Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. He thus contradicted all those Germans who, even seven years after the end of the Third Reich, claimed to be clueless victims of Hitler. True, Heuss said, there is no collective guilt, but quote, something like collective shame has grown and remained from those times. With this statement, the German head of state set the tone and the standard for how to deal with German crimes and in particular with what would only much later be called the Holocaust. He did so in a language that was gentler on his compatriots than Thomas Mann's language had been during the war, but it was a language that was hardly any less clear in political and moral terms. Heuss thus paved the way for a self-critical examination of the Nazi past, which, after slow beginnings, gained momentum in the 1960s and eventually became a defining feature of the political culture and the very identity of the Federal Republic. For some two decades now, this has been encapsulated by the term Erinnerungskultur. However, the high levels of support for such a culture of remembrance seem to be a thing of the past. Today, we are seeing not only a skepticism about what Erinnerungskultur actually implies, 
but also a radical political critique of the concept itself. Attacks are coming from both the radical right and the post-colonial left. Leading representatives of the right-wing AFD, for example, have embraced the well-worn proposition that the continued examination of our dark past would be detrimental to a, quote, self-confident nation. They argue that Germany's ongoing reparation payments would weaken us in the political and economic power struggle. In light of Germany's glorious thousand-year-old history, the Nazi period in their view was just bird shit. To overcome the, quote, state of mind of a totally defeated people, it would take a, quote again, 180-degree turn in the politics of memory. Such statements contain a barely concealed anti-Semitism. Something similar can be found in the post-colonial critique of Germany's Erinnerungskultur. For example, in claims that Germans merely complied with demands imposed on them by, quote, American, British and Israeli elites, thereby neglecting the commemoration of other groups that have been victims of German racism, colonialism and imperialism. Nobody in Germany who takes the ethics of memory and the commitment to human rights seriously will claim that the examination of the Nazi past exhausts the work that Germans as a society need to do in view of their history. But it must be equally clear that our reckoning with this part of our history cannot and must not be discontinued, because of the fully justified addition of new perspectives from the global south. If the statement is to remain valid that Germans after 1945 have learned from their history, coming to terms with our history before 1945 remains a task that can never be finished. <laughs>